So in the last couple of sessions, we've been talking about how we measure some of the properties of stars, um, what properties can we measure directly, and based on those measurements, what other properties of the star can we figure it out? So if we can measure, so we, let's say what we can we uh, directly measure. And then we can find, we can figure out which are the following. So for example, we can directly measure the parallax of the star as the Earth orbits the sun. Uh, we can see the apparent change in position of at least relatively nearby stars. So we can directly measure that parallax. And that allows us to figure out the distance. If let's say we can measure the apparent brightness. So that's something we can directly measure. And that plus the distance, if we have those two together, we can determine the luminosity. So if I know the apparent brightness and the distance, I can figure out the luminosity. If I look at the spectrum, we talked about stellar classification. We talked about Wien's law and say, well, if I know the spectrum, we can determine the temperature of the star. So surface temperature, I should say. And we said, if we know surface temperature and luminosity, we can find the size of the star, so the uh, star radius. And let me even put in a couple of the equations that are relevant for this. So uh, the distance was one over the parallax. Uh, the luminosity is the brightness times four pi times the distance square. Uh, to get the star radius, we had luminosity is 4 pi times the radius of the star squared times Boltzmann's constant times temperature to the power of 4. That one was a little bit messy. Um, but we can determine all these things about the star. We can also look at the orbit. So orbits of binary stars. We can measure their mass. And we had a modified version of Kepler's uh, third law in order to measure the mass of systems where we have two stars that are orbiting each other. And if we can measure the orbital distance, if we can measure the orbital period or the uh, orbital speeds, if we can measure some combination of those, then under certain conditions, we can figure out the masses of those stars. And we found that stars come in a wide range of temperatures and a wide range of luminosities. So we can do this for lots and lots of different stars. But, okay, at this point, we can look at all these stars, we can measure their properties, and we can kind of get a list of stats for all these stars. But this doesn't really yet tell us a whole lot about how stars actually work. What are the properties uh, um, what are the mechanisms that are going on inside of these stars? Why do stars have certain properties? Why do they have different types? And to try to actually analyze some of this data, whenever we're doing pretty much any kind of science, we're trying to collect some data, make some measurements, do some observations and collect data. And then we try to find patterns in that data. So we're gonna look at the patterns that we find in this data that we have from stars by looking at what's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Okay. Well, let's take this and talk about the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Or HR diagram. So this is the basic idea of this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. On one axis, we have the luminosity. 
most of the time this luminosity is given in comparison with our sun. So one would just be the luminosity of our sun. 10 means it's 10 times more luminous than the sun. 100 is 100 times more luminous. 0.1 is 1 tenth as luminous, so on and so forth. So we get something that looks like this. So 1 to 10 to 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. And then we go to less luminous stars, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.001. And on the other axis, we have the spectral types, the O, B, A, F, G, K, M classification scheme. So that's up here as well. And the way that we make this diagram is for every star that we measure its properties, you know, we measure its luminosity and we measure the spectral class, we're going to put one dot on this graph. So for example, for our sun, we'd say, well, the sun's luminosity in solar units by definition is just one. And our sun is a type G2 star. So if the luminosity is one, and the type is a G2 star, that's going to show up right around here. That would be our sun. And then we look at other stars. And for every star that we identify, we put one dot on this little graph. So again, for each star, we make a dot that corresponds to that star's luminosity and that star's surface temperature. And what we get is some very, very well-defined patterns. This is actually the newest, uh, pretty much the newest uh, HR diagram that we have using data from the Gaia mission that has literally measured the distances and thereby the allows to measure the luminosities and spectral types of mil like many millions of stars. Like I think they've done over a billion stars included on this diagram. So we're talking hundreds of millions to over a billion stars on this diagram. Now you might think if we're looking at the luminosities of stars and the uh, temperatures of these stars, we might just get stuff all over the map, just randomly filling up this entire graph. But that's not what we find. We find certain regions of the graph where there are a lot of stars that have those similar properties and other regions of the graph where you see almost no stars. So what we tend to find, again, the, the way that we graph this is we put luminosity on the vertical axis. We put the spectral type, the spectral class, the OBAFGKM on the horizontal axis. And again, instead of these stars covering the entire graph, we find distinct categories of stars that are referred to as luminosity classes. Uh, these luminosity classes are sometimes given as um, Roman numeral configurations, one, two, three, four, five, and D for dwarf. But we're just gonna kind of talk about a few of these luminosity classes and kind of bunch some of the other ones together. So let's talk about some of these properties. We're generally going to get the following patterns. There's going to be one band that kind of cuts diagonally across this diagram, something like this. So we get a band of stars that's cutting diagonally across the diagram. On the previous one, um, notice the way that these are scaled can be a little bit different. That's going to kind of change the overall shape of these graphs. But we get this diagonal band of stars going across the graph. That's going to be one of these classes of stars. In the upper right corner, we're going to get a second class of stars up there. And down here, we're going to get a third class of stars. So we're going to talk about the properties uh, of these stars. So again, we've get the uh, certain bunch of stars in this kind of upper right portion of the graph. Again, the scaling is a little bit different here. We get this long diagonal band across the graph. And we get this cluster down here. There is a huge amount of information that we extract 
from this HR diagram. This is probably the main thing that tells us about the properties of stars and how stars, um, what's going on internally inside of the stars. It gives us a huge amount of information. And let's just talk about some of the other information that we have. Let's look at this equation. This was our luminosity equation. I have it in a slightly rearranged version. Luminosity is uh, Boltzmann's constant times temperature to the power of four times four pi times the radius of the star squared. So we have this relationship between luminosity, temperature, and star radius. Suppose I was looking at a star in this region up here. A star that has a very, very high luminosity, despite having a low surface temperature. So if I have a star that has a very, very large luminosity, even though these are spectral types K and M, they have a very, very low surface temperature, what does that tell us about the radius of these stars, the size of these stars? So pause the video for a minute and think about that. If we have these stars in this upper right corner that have both a very high luminosity and a relatively low surface temperature, what can I say about their size? Well, if they have this really high luminosity, despite having a low surface temperature, they have to be very, very large. That's the only way that this equation will balance itself out, is if the sizes of these stars are absolutely enormous. In fact, this group of stars up here, the spectral class that we give them, or sorry, the, not the spectral class, the luminosity class that we give them are giants and supergiants. So giants and supergiants. They're up in that top part of the screen. So you have those giants and supergiants. So basically, if you go further up and or to the right on this graph, that's larger and larger star radii. What if I have a star in this lower part down here where the luminosity is very low? So we have a very low luminosity in this bottom left-hand corner. It's a very low luminosity, but these are really, really high temperature stars. They're the type O, B, and A stars that have a very, very high surface temperature. What does that imply about the sizes of these stars? So pause the video, have a think about that one. Well, if it has a very low luminosity, despite having a high surface temperature, those stars must be very, very small. In fact, in this bottom corner of the graph, this luminosity class is called the white dwarf class. So white dwarfs. Not necessarily entirely PC, but okay, that's the name that they've got. And this band across the middle, we're going to call that the main sequence. So again, just based on their positions on the diagram, we can actually identify how large are these stars. So if I were to draw a bunch of uh, kind of angled lines like this, these lines that I'm drawing, these would be lines of constant star radius. So the further up and to the right that, oh, that one wasn't very good. Uh, the further up and to the right that I go, the larger the radius of these stars. So if I have two stars on this diagram, I can directly compare their radii in this particular case, right, based on their locations on this diagram. So we're going to talk about these luminosity classes. And again, the three luminosity classes that we're going to be talking about are the main sequence, that kind of diagonal band across the diagram. Giants and supergiants, we're going to kind of lump those together for now. Again, there are subclasses of this, but we're just going to lump that into giants and supergiants. And down here in the lower left, we have the white dwarfs. So let's talk about some of these properties. For the main sequence, 
This is about 90% of all stars. So let me write main sequence. This is 90% of stars. We give this luminosity class, it's the luminosity class V. We're not gonna worry about that part for now. There are two things that characterize main sequence stars. The first is that they're in gravitational equilibrium and they're fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. So the two defining features of the main sequence are they've got gravitational equilibrium. And, and think if you can remember for a second what gravitational equilibrium means. So see if you can remember that and then we'll talk about it. So they're in the gravitational equilibrium. And they're fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. Our sun is an example of a main sequence star. It's in gravitational equilibrium. That means that there's this inward force of gravity trying to crush the star. And the fusion reaction that's going on inside of the core, that's generating the, the, the heat and the high temperatures to allow thermal pressure to support the star against collapse. And when you have a star in gravitational equilibrium, that star is in a balanced state. Those two forces, the inward force of gravity and the outward force of thermal pressure are balanced. And again, we said our sun is doing this. And it's also, these stars are fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. There are a bunch of different properties that we can compare with these main sequence stars. For example, we know that we can measure the masses of these stars when they're in binary systems, which happens quite a lot. And there's a pattern on the main sequence. If you're on the upper left part of this diagram, that star is going to have a high mass. So these are just looking at main sequence stars. Um, up here we have high mass. And in this bottom corner, we have low mass. So if I have two main sequence stars and I know where they are along this HR diagram, if they're in like two different locations, the one that is further up and to the left, that one is going to have a higher mass. When we measure the properties, we find that these properties match. If it's not on the main sequence, I really want to emphasize, if it's not on the main sequence, we cannot determine the mass of the star from this diagram alone. Okay. This diagram only allows us to compare masses of main sequence stars. Other things happen when the star leaves the main sequence, when it turns into another type of star. So there's other patterns on the main sequence, uh, patterns in the core temperatures of these stars, the fusion rates of these stars, and the main sequence lifetimes, how long a star will stay as a main sequence star. So let's talk about these patterns. Well, if I have a high mass star, let's say I have one of these high mass main sequence stars, that means there's gonna be a lot of gravitational force trying to push in on that star. But we said, that these stars are in gravitational equilibrium. So if they have a higher mass and gravity is trying to compress these stars by a greater degree, that means there has to be a higher fusion rate, a greater uh, thermal pressure inside of that star that's supporting the star against collapse. So, in order to keep the star balanced, if these high mass main sequence stars are in gravitational equilibrium, they have a high core temp. So high core temp. And a high fusion rate. I recommend drawing one of these 
HR diagrams really large on a single piece of paper so you can kind of write down some of these properties and have it all in one place. On the other hand, if I have a low mass star, and, and remember, all these main sequence stars are pretty much the same size. If we go back to this diagram, some of them are a little bit smaller, some of them are a little bit larger, but most of those main sequence stars are actually pretty much the same size. So again, the higher the mass, uh, the higher the mass, the greater the force of gravity is going to be trying to collapse it. So we need more fusion reaction, a greater fusion reaction to support the star against collapse. On the other side, we have the opposite rate. Uh, if it's low mass, it does not need a high core temperature or core fusion rate. So this would be uh, low core temp and fusion rate. Once again, this is only for stars on the main sequence. If they are not main sequence stars, we can't compare and contrast them in these particular ways. So let's look at this as an example. Uh, I put our sun on this diagram. It's kind of a higher temperature G star, luminosity of one. We can look at the masses of stars that show up on different parts on these this free body diagram. So if it's one and a half times the mass of the sun, it's probably over here. If it's three times the mass, six times the mass, 10 times the mass, 30 times the mass, 60 times the mass, the higher the mass, the higher up and to the left on this diagram that star is going to be. On the other side, we have our low mass stars. This is about 30% the mass of the sun, 10% the mass of the sun, and our smaller stars, our lower mass stars are gonna be on this side. And again, because of the higher masses of these stars, there's a greater inward force of gravity trying to crush the star. So to support it against collapse, it must have a higher core fusion rate, a higher core temperature in order to keep it balanced. Vice versa for the low mass stars. For the low mass stars, it does not need a very fast fusion rate and it does not need... Um, it does not need a very high core temperature. We can also, on this diagram, track the main sequence lifetimes. Approximately how long are these stars expected to last as main sequence stars? Going from our sun will be a main sequence star. Its main sequence lifetime is around 10 billion years. Stars over here, they might only last 1 billion years as main sequence stars. These ones might only last 100 million years. These ones will only last maybe 10 million years. And these ones even less time. They'll only last for a few million years. I know that sounds like a lot of time, but in cosmic time, a few million years is almost nothing. Uh, so these stars won't last very long. Now, at this point, you should be asking, how in the heck do we know how long these stars last? The lifetime, the expected lifetimes of these stars. And especially for these ones over here, these ones were saying they are expected to last around 100 billion years. The universe hasn't even been around that long. So how long, how do I know how long these stars last? Okay. Well, let's try to do a quick little calculation on how one of these stars compares to our sun. This is used in conjunction with, we know some of the properties of our sun, we can do computer simulations of our sun, we know the fusion rate, we know how much fuel is in there. We can get a pretty good estimate on how long our sun will be able to burn hydrogen at its current rate before the core runs out of hydrogen and it is no longer a main sequence star. And again, that number is around 10 billion years. But let's say how another star will compare. Let's take a star that is 10 times the mass of our sun. I'm gonna zoom in on this a little bit more so we can see this a little bit more clearly. Let's do that. So I'm interested in a star 
that is around 10 times the mass of our sun. If it's 10 times the mass of our sun, let's do a kind of quick comparison with our star. If it's 10 times the mass of our sun, we can say that it probably has somewhere around 10 times the amount of fuel. Again, the fuel for these stars is the fusion reaction that's going inside of the core of these stars. All other things being equal, again, there might be a little bit more greater percentage of the mass in the core if it's a larger star, but let's kind of take it as an approximately 10 times the amount of fuel. But these stars have a luminosity 10,000 times greater than the luminosity of our sun. They're burning that energy. They're going through its fuel 10,000 times faster. Which means if I've got 10 times the fuel, but I'm going through that fuel 10,000 times faster, that means the expected lifetime, the amount of time it's going to take it to run out of its fuel, is only going to be 1 1,000th the lifetime of our sun. Our sun, its predicted lifetime is around 10 billion years. So these stars would only last around 10 million years. These high mass main sequence stars are kind of like the gas guzzlers uh, of astronomy. Like if you think of, you know, different cars, like an SUV compared to a, you know, a very small car, some, uh, I don't know what, but some sort of smaller economic car. The SUV might have a larger gas tank, but it's burning through its fuel so much more rapidly that it can't actually go as far as one of these smaller cars, with, even though that smaller car has a smaller gas tank. Also, let me, let me kind of mention this one as well. When I said that we know something about the core fusion rates, for these high mass stars, we know these stars are in gravitational equilibrium. So gravitational equilibrium. So basically these stars are balanced in their structure, their energy generation, how much energy they emit. Uh, the system is in a nice balance. But Let's see how this luminosity, if we have a star that's in a balanced state, how does this luminosity relate to the fusion rate in the core? So let's say I have a star and we have the core. And this core is where the fusion re uh, reaction is going. So there's fusion, it's producing energy, and that energy is leaving the core and supporting the star against collapse. On the surface of the star, energy is being given off as luminosity. So this is the luminosity. This is the energy released from the surface. From surface. Well, if this star is in a balanced state, it's not starting to puff up, it's not starting to collapse, it's in a nice balanced state, then in these intervening layers, the energy into these intervening layers, so the energy in from the core, must equal the energy out from the surface. If the core was... Uh, if the core was giving off its energy too quickly, if the core was going through too much fusion, then those intervening layers are going to be absorbing more energy than they're getting rid of, and that will cause those outer layers to puff up. We'll actually be talking about this process when we talk about how stars leave the main sequence when they run out of uh, material to fuse. But if I have one of these stars that's in this gravitational equilibrium, the luminosity of the star, the amount of energy that's being given off the surface of the star must match the amount of energy that's being generated in the core. So again, that kind of tells us how we know that 
if the luminosity is 10,000 times greater, the fusion rate inside the cores of these stars must be 10,000 times faster. So it has a much shorter lifetime. That those high mass main sequence stars, they have more mass, but they're burning through their fuel very, very quickly. So going back to here, going back to our HR diagram, we have for lifetimes, we have short lifetime up here. And down here, we have longer life. So higher mass has a shorter lifetime. In the complete kind of reverse way, these lower mass stars have a higher lifetime. They have less fuel, but they're burning through that fuel very, very slowly. They don't have high core fusion rates. Again, we can only compare these on the main sequence. So these high mass main sequence stars, they won't last very long. These low mass main sequence stars will last a very, very long time. So I kind of described this already a little bit, but it's worth revisiting. I've claimed we've got these patterns for these different main sequence stars. Uh, in the top, uh, top left of the diagram, they have high mass, high core temperatures, high fusion rates, and short lifetimes. In the lower right of that main sequence band, they have low core temperatures, low fusion rates, low mass, and long lifetimes. So again, as I was kind of saying, for a star in gravitational equilibrium, these fusion rates are directly related to the luminosity of the star. So again, for stable stars, that inward gravitational pull must be countered by pressure from the fusion reaction. More mass means more gravity, means a higher fusion rate. And again, on this main sequence, the luminosity of the star increases much, much faster than the star's mass increases. So it's got a little bit more fuel, but it's burning through that fuel far, far faster, leading to those short lifetimes. And we can now, we now have the ability to use computer simulations. We've done experiments with fusion to know more of the properties of how fusion works. Um, we can use computer simulations to model the interiors of these stars and show more of the details of how these patterns emerge. And in a subsequent session, we're also going to look at star clusters and how star clusters give us a very, very reliable tool, a very, very robust tool in testing some of these claims and being able to make testable predictions of how different clusters of stars will evolve. If I have a cluster of stars, it's made up of some high mass stars, some low mass stars, they start out at the same time. How do the different stars develop at different times and in different ways? Okay, so we're going to have, have spent most of the time on the main sequence. We're going to talk about some of these other types as well. So let's talk about the giants and supergiants. So the giants and supergiants, that's in this upper right portion of the diagram. Again, as their name suggests, they are very, very large. Uh, this is about 1% of stars. 1% of all stars are giants or supergiants. And there's a bunch of luminosity classes for these, luminosity class one to three. We're just going to call this luminosity class giants and supergiants. So our luminosity classes are main sequence, giants and supergiants, and white dwarfs. These stars are late stage or dying stars. They've run out of uh, hydrogen fuel in their cores. So now they might be uh, fusing heavier elements in their cores, or they might be fusing hydrogen outside of their cores. But remember, they're not going to be have these properties of the main sequence. They're generally not in equilibrium, so they're unstable. In fact, some of them are actually going through like pulsations. We'll talk about those kind of uh, variable stars later on. And they're either fusing heavier elements in their cores, or they're fusing hydrogen outside of their cores. So again, just distinguishing between these giants and supergiants and main sequence stars. Compared to their main sequence lifetimes, 
stars spend very little time in these giant and super giant phases. Uh, basically, the time it spends in the giant or super giant phase is usually less than 1% of its main sequence lifetime. So for example, our sun is expected to be a main sequence star for about 10 billion years, and then it will expand into a giant and it will only spend maybe a hundred million, a hundred million years um, as a giant before it uh, finally dies off. Okay. So again, giants and super giants, only about 1% of stars. Uh, they're unstable, fusing heavier elements in their cores, and they only last as giants and super giants for a short time. When we talk about star evolution, we'll talk about the properties of these giants and super giants in more detail, but for now, we'll leave it at that. The last set down here, these white dwarfs, these actually account for about 10% of all stars. And these are very small, very hot. Uh, we call this luminosity class D. And these are no longer going through fusion. So no more fusion. They are essentially the leftover dead cores of stars that have gone through their lives and eventually ejected away all of their other material. It's not fusion that supports these stars against collapse, but this weird property that we call electron degeneracy pressure. We'll talk about what that is a little bit later, but just as a quick, um, a quick description of what that is. For those of you who have taken a chemistry course where you've talked about orbitals, you may have heard in a chemistry course that electrons don't, electrons in an atom don't like being in the exact same state. They will not be in the same state. That force, that force that stops electrons from being in that same state, that's actually what's supporting these stars against collapse. These things are so compressed and small, and these electrons are so close together that the only thing that's supporting this thing against collapse is the fact that those electrons don't want to be in the same energy state. It's a really weird kind of object. Again, we'll talk about these in more detail when we talk about the different types of dead stars. And these things are not going to do much other than cool down over a very, very long time. Like there are no white dwarfs in the universe that have cooled down all that much because the universe hasn't been around that long. It would take probably around 100 billion years for one of these white dwarfs to actually cool down. So again, these white dwarf classes and these giant and super giant classes, we're going to talk about those in more detail in the uh, couple sessions from now. Uh, but that kind of gives us an initial look at this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Again, going up and to the right on the diagram, we've got larger stars. Down and to the left on the diagram, they're going to be smaller stars. And these particular patterns, uh, we've got these main sequence stars that have very, very particular patterns, these giants and super giants, and these white dwarfs. So let's look at a couple of uh, questions, kind of comparing and contrasting these different kinds of stars. OK, so let's do a compare and contrast between different stars. So let's say we've got uh, four stars to choose from, A, B, C, and D. Um, try to actually, let's actually you know, pause your video, uh, go to the slide, and try to go through these questions before we start talking about the answer. So pause the video and have a go at kind of saying which of these stars have some of these properties. OK, so let's try the first one. Uh, which star is a supergiant with a low surface temperature? Well, if it's a giant or supergiant, it should be in the upper right part of the diagram. And if it's got a low surface temperature, it's probably class K or M. So star B for that one. Next one. Uh, which star is the most massive main sequence star? Well, our main sequence stars are the stars that go along this diagonal path. We've got, so A and D are main sequence stars. And we want the one that has a high mass. So that's going to be in the upper left corner. So that would be star A. What about which star no longer has any kind of nuclear fusion going on in it? That would be one of these white dwarfs. 
star C. Again, the main sequence stars, they're fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. These giants and supergiants, they're either fusing heavier elements or fusing hydrogen outside of their cores. Uh, so all these ones do have some kind of fusion going on. Just these white dwarfs are no longer going through any fusion. What about this one? Which star is extremely luminous and emits mostly in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum? Okay. So on this graph, if we want stars that are a high luminosity, they'll be near the top of this graph. Because again, this vertical axis, this is measuring luminosity. So we want something near the top of the graph. But we also want this to be emitting light mostly in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Well, if I have a star that's emitting a lot of UV light, a lot of short wavelength, high energy light, that means it's gonna be a very, very high temperature, probably an O or B type star. So if I want high luminosity and high surface temperature, that's gonna be star A. This last one, uh, fusing hydrogen in its core at a rate thousands of times slower than our sun. So the first part, the first hint, fusing hydrogen in its core. Well, that suggests it's a main sequence star. So again, it's on this diagonal path. But we're told that this fusion rate is very, very slow. So it's a very low fusion rate. Well, if it's a main sequence star with a low fusion rate, that means it has to be one of the ones down in the bottom right part of this diagram. These low mass, low core temperature, low fusion rate main sequence stars. So that would be star D. So these kinds of questions, you should expect these kinds of questions on uh, on homework activities, you know, the next uh, unit test, uh, being able to kind of compare and contrast the properties of these stars. You if it's talking about specific stars, it'll probably give you the diagram somewhere on there, but you should know the general kind of shape of the diagram. Main sequence stars are making this diagonal path across the diagram, giants and supergiants in the upper right, uh, white dwarfs in the lower left part of the diagram. Let's look at a couple more questions. What can we infer at least roughly from a star's luminosity class? And where are the largest stars? So again, pause the video, have a go at some of these ones, and we'll talk about that one once you unpause it. Okay, so what can we infer at least roughly from a star's luminosity class? This one would be its size. We said that as you go up and to the right, the size of the star increases. So these would be lines of constant size. So if it's a giant or supergiant, it's pretty large. If it's a white dwarf, it's pretty small. The main sequence stars are all pretty close to the same size. So that's what we mean by we can at least roughly identify uh, the size. Just to kind of talk about some of these other ones, um, the mass, if it's a main sequence star, we could have low mass main sequence stars, or we can have high mass main sequence stars. Depending on, for the giants and supergiants, depending on what stage of evolution it's in, those stars of similar masses can puff up to different sizes. Um, with surface temperatures, we get main sequence stars of lots of different surface temperatures, giants and supergiants of lots of different surface temperatures. Um, their age, how long they last. Again, along the main sequence, we can have main sequence stars with very different lifetimes. So the only one of these that we can infer approximately just from the luminosity class is kind of the size of that star. And I've kind of already answered this one. Where are the largest stars? That's going to be the upper right part of the diagram where these supergiants are. The... Last part, let's do a couple more of these. Um, again, pause the video, give this a try and see how some of these compare. Okay, so this diagram, I'm gonna zoom in on this part a little bit more so we can see this with a bit more accuracy. Um, this diagram can actually help us solve a lot of different questions involving 
luminosity, spectral type or temperature equivalently, and the size of the star. So let's say I'm looking at this first statement. Two stars have the same luminosity. One is spectral type B, the other is spectral type K. So if they have the same luminosity, let me try just drawing two of them on here. I'm just gonna draw one. This is a spectral type B, let's put it here. So that's the first star. And the other star is a type K star. So we have to put it over here, but it's got the same luminosity. It's the same vertical position on this graph. And the claim is that the type B star is larger than the type K star. Well, we know that the size of these stars increases as you go up and to the right. So this star would be one of the giants. This one is still a main sequence star. So this statement would be false. The type K star would be the larger one. Instead of having to go through the equation and say, if we have luminosity is this equation, write the equation. We're saying they have the same luminosity, but the type K star is a much lower temperature. Well, that means it has to be a, a star that is larger in size. You can answer this question using the equation as well. And in fact, I recommend that you practice both of these methods for comparing and contrasting these stars. But the HR diagram can be really helpful in quickly comparing those different stars. So let's try the next one. Two stars have the same temperature, so they'd be the same spectral class. One has a luminosity 100 times higher than the other. The more luminous star is larger. Okay, let's try this. So let's say we have a star here and a star that is 100 times more luminous, but the same temperature, so it's the same spectral type. The more luminous star is larger, yeah, it's higher up. If it's either higher up or further to the right on the diagram, we know that that star is gonna be larger. So this more luminous star is in fact larger one. So that statement, this statement is true. This first one is false. This one is true. And let's look at the last one. Two stars have the same radius. One is spectral type B, the other is spectral type K. The B star is more luminous. Well, if these are the same radius, remember we drew kind of those diagonal lines to say these are all stars of the same radius. So these are all same radius. We've got a type B and we've got a type K. For this diagram, the higher up the star, the more luminous it is. So yeah, this type B star, this one is going to be more luminous if we read off the luminosities of these stars. Yeah, the type B star was the one that was more luminous. So this is also true. Another way of looking at that is, let's say the radius is the same. And the spectral type B has a higher surface te temperature. Well, if it's the same radius and a higher temperature, that means it also has to have a higher luminosity. Again, we can answer these questions either with the diagram or with the equation. I recommend practicing both because if you have more ways of kind of checking your work and, and testing the claims that you're making, that's gonna be more reliable. So again, you should expect to see some of these kinds of questions on uh, future homeworks and potentially you know test questions, things like that. We'll, in the next video, we'll talk a little bit about how star clusters allow us to gain an even deeper understanding of these patterns that we see in this HR diagram and allow us to scientifically test some of the claims that we've made here.